Right, excellent. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Insights 2021, How Brands Are Sustaining Category Growth. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer of the real-time market research platform, Suzy. And we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands in helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for both quantitative and qualitative insights to drive business decisions. And I'm really excited to welcome you with today's, to today's discussion with three fantastic companies in the category management shopper insights arena. So in just a moment, we'll talk to them about what they're doing to keep the growth momentum happening from last year, even as consumer sentiments shift on a daily, if not weekly, if not um, hour by hour basis. So first of all, let's get to know each other a little bit better. So Phil, if you could kick us off and tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Sure. sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you uh, both to the, the CMA for hosting and uh, Susie for providing the platform. I uh, always uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, the category management uh, uh, insight space. Uh, so I am Phil DeCanto. I lead uh, our category management and shopper insights efforts here at Ferrero. Uh, Ferrero, as you may be familiar, is a uh, global manufacturer within the uh, sweet packaged goods space. So brands like Nutella, Kinder, uh, Ferrero Rocher, Butterfinger, Tic Tac, to name a couple uh, here within the United States. Uh, so uh, we, uh, my, my team and I work uh, on uh, all things category management. Uh, DSMP, as we say it, or MAPS or PORTES, or pick your favorite acronym, but that's, uh, that's our term. Excellent, thank you. And Yelena, if you could share with everybody uh, more about you and your role, that would be awesome. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, great to be here. Uh, my name is Yelena Idelchuk. I am the Director of Category Management and Shopper Insights at Racket Bank Kieser. And uh, my team focuses on uh, tracking trends, delivering new custom uh, insights to the organization, as well as supporting the category management team uh, with our customers, uh, focusing on our captaincies and really helping uh, consult uh, different retailers in how to optimize their categories. Uh, the focus on hygiene is a passion. Uh, of course, our brands of Lysol, Airwick, and Finish are top of mind for a lot of consumers right now, which is quite an exciting place to be in. Excellent. And very much last but not least, Lindsay. All right. Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Lindsay St. Hauser, Shopper Insights Lead at Campbell Snack. Um, which is a division under the Campbell Soup Company. Um, I support the growth in grocery channels across all of our Campbell Snack brands, which many of you probably have within your pantries, which include Goldfish, Kettle Brand, Cape Cod, Snyder's, Milano, um, Pepper's from Swirl Bread, um, and so on. So that's, there's many more. Um, but my focus is really on shopper insight to our total enterprise across the marketing, sales, innovation, commercialization, communication, and PR teams. Um, and also cross-functional work with our category manager team, um, as well as our consumer insights and corporate team. So I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but uh, we are definitely better and stronger together. Awesome, thank you so much. And right before this call, everybody, we were chatting about each other's products and uh, we're all four of us big fans of each other's companies and each other's products. So I'm gonna get started on some of the questions. So it's been just over a year um, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic stay at home order. My Facebook was popping up with lots of the I'm working from home for a week messages over the past week. So uh, looking back, what have you learned um, over this past year? And let's start with what's been most successful for your brand. So Yelena, you're working in a very interesting um, company with a lot of categories that have been very successful this year. Tell us a little more about what's, what's been working. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the interesting thing is that COVID became uh, as a big surprise and a massive disruptor to so many shoppers. And as we know, the massive disruptions are clear ways uh, for the trends that were sort of there before, but those trends get accelerated. So in some ways, uh, we cleared the way to all these trends to be front and center and uh, said in other ways, the future is here now. Uh, that change the relationship that shoppers have with their health, with their home, with their brands and their retailers. And what was interesting to us is we always thought of disinfection, for example, as something more seasonal in nature. We always looked at cold and flu season, for example. And what happened was people realized that they need to protect themselves, their health, their family is an ongoing project. And 
when we thought in the past we had avian flu, we had Ebola, we had Zika, and of course COVID, shoppers don't know what is going to come next and when COVID will be completely cleared away from our plates. Therefore, you know, Lysol disinfecting spray, for example, and some other cleaning products that are protecting your family and your health become staples, just like Tylenol, Band-Aid, Benadryl, and some other big brands are. This now becomes something that consumers really cannot live without. So we were happy that we were there at the right time, providing the right solutions. We were always prepared for this, but now the situation culminated into that uh, success that we could provide and the support that we could provide for our consumers. Excellent, and we thank you for it. <laughs> Lindsay, obviously very different category that you work in, but what's been, what's been working for you over the last year and what, what's your brand faced? So I think you absolutely nailed it. Um, it's crazy to think that a year ago we were getting the email saying, all right, everyone's going to work remotely. We were all like, oh, see you next month. Um, but we quickly realized that wasn't really the case. Um, and so our team really began this uh, lo COVID learning journey. Um, so beginning in March, we consistently spoke to our um, and engaged with our proprietary panel of consumers and shoppers that we tapped into. And we created over 15 volumes of these shopper and consumer behaviors that we were um, sharing internally and externally. So um, with that, we kind of covered everyday mindset, behaviors, tracked my macro trends and any um, thing that emerged and also focused on holidays because they were all going to be very different. Um, at the same time, we also fielded research against new buyers to our brands um, and online shopping because that was uh, just exploding in a category. It was a little bit slower than many other categories, but we did see a lot of growth there for us. Um, and from that, we were able to kind of capture insights that we could really action on, and we have, which is great. Um, from all of that, we kind of tracked that in-home consumption, which exploded during key mail and snack occasions. Um, we watched the evolution of how shoppers were consuming our categories during these occasions. Uh, we learned and leaned into key shifts in behaviors where we saw kind of the shopper changes. Um, and motivations for why they were purchasing our snack categories. Um, and as we close out the year, uh, we did see these new behaviors kind of continue, but they did evolve in some way. So because of this um, being a health pandemic and lives had completely been turned upside down, we did see shoppers focus on um, self-care and wellness. Um, so addressing those physical and mental needs to really gain control back in their lives. Um, and what I think we found a lot of success in is that um, brand names really played a key role uh, to provide comfort and connection to all of these um, shoppers and consumers. And so uh, everyday brands like our Goldfish really provided that nostalgia. Um, and then during seasonal windows, our Pepperidge Farm stuffing, like really kind of, um, they, we leaned into and consumers really wanted that to kind of celebrate. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And Phil, what about yourself? Sure. So yeah, it's it's funny. I think uh, the CMA conference was my last official business trip. So again, speaking back to the mm -hmm. the weird anniversaries, uh, you know, I think I just laughed that. The other major anniversary we're coming up on is that initial pandemic surge of volume. That uh, there was that initial stock up time period. I, I have New England roots, so I'm used to blizzard shopping, and it feels like the U.S. prepared for a blizzard. Uh, so uh, you know, I think. Uh, tracking and understanding that in the moment, I think, was really important. Uh, and then now figuring out how to best overlap that time period becomes the, the next challenge. Mm -hmm. As Lindsay mentioned, there was this real surge, of course, in in-home consumption. Uh, we were talking a bit beforehand about um, uh, the, the change to the breakfast occasion that I think for a generation or so, the, the way people have been consuming breakfast has been changing and has been migrating more and more out of the house. And that was a, a real impact that we saw change uh, very early on in the pandemic, especially again, uh, where we're, we're selling Nutella, uh, the, that, that, that take home breakfast, that uh, at home breakfast opportunity, I think has, has really surged and driven a, a real increase in volume. So again, uh, gating work so that we can properly understand uh, what that occasion is, uh, how, how that has shifted in this time period. And then now, as you start to think about the, uh, the, the future, uh, where is that behavior going to go uh, in, in the next six, nine, 12 months? Uh, the other thing uh, that, that we talked a little bit about was the idea of snacking and also in-home indulgence that a lot of those treat opportunities that you ordinarily might see out in the world, whether you're, you're stopping at a, a quick serve restaurant or maybe you're, you're ordering a slice of pie after dinner at a restaurant or whatever the case, those opportunities have all come home. So we've, 
we've seen a, a real increase in at-home indulgence, especially within the, the, the take-home packs of, of various confections. Uh, so again, it's been very interesting to see that, that trend and uh, measure that over time. Yeah, that's great. Um, and as we kind of mentioned, we all got that email to say, you're going to have to work from home for a week or two weeks, or it's extending another week um, or so. None of us could really foresee that we'd still be here 12 months later, all still working from home. Um, so is there anything that you wish you could have done differently had you kind of known that it would be a, such a, a long lockdown? Um, and you're left with you, was there anything that your brands could have done differently or you wish you could have done differently? Yes. So I think actually quite a few things were done right and we we're almost like ready for this. But what we discovered is shoppers were actually extremely misinformed in what products to use and how to use them, what products are intended for what. So that education gap became much more apparent in our world and something that is definitely a great opportunity for the industry or, or you know itself sometimes there are a lot of legal nuances that prevent us from doing it more directly with the shoppers but definitely a huge opportunity to drive more of the shopper satisfaction uh, the other one is we all saw the escalation of the omni channel and really understanding and getting ahead of that for click and collect for um some of the specific nuances about what sells online versus in store, you know, what is the value in bulk and just really what is the value in understanding for our products that is in shoppers minds, because it is not just the absolute price. It is so much more of what the product can do for me. And I guess that comes through education again. So those would be probably my top ones. Yeah, similar to, to what Lindsay said about kind of that brand recognition as well, of going back to brands that you know and you love and you can trust seems to be to be really important. Um, with that, Lindsay, was there anything that you that you wish had happened differently over the last year? So kind of similar to what Yelena said, um, I think we did a really good job and dealt with what we were given in such a short amount of time. Uh, we really jumped into action and prioritized. Um, I think one thing that we probably could have done better is just uh, really focused on this central hub of learning um, because I think everyone was like, what's happening? And went into these immediate reactions uh, within each of their teams. Um, so I think just creating this one siloed version, which we did um, impact, we have created this unified um, insights portion within Campbell Snacks, uh, really partnering together. So I think that's one thing that we probably could have um, done differently at the very get go. Yeah, that makes sense. And what about yourself, Phil? Sure. So, you know, I think uh, one one element of that was uh, uh, better understanding shipment to consumption. I think uh, our supply chain team did a, a really fantastic job given a, uh, a, a, a hopefully once in a lifetime challenge, right? I'm, I'm sure uh, all organizations plan for a certain level of safety stock, but you, you probably don't plan for surges of 30, 50, 200%. Uh, uh, need over, over overnight, right? Uh, but so I think uh, better tracking and, and understanding that shipment to consumption relationship, uh, not just on an everyday basis, but then also I think better understanding seasons has become really important. Uh, as, as I think uh, somebody mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Easter was the first time period for, for us from a confection standpoint that was, was impacted and understanding that dynamic between everyday and seasonalized packs and uh, you know where you know, where where you are from a supply standpoint, uh, where you are from an on uh, on shelf standpoint, I think was was really important. The other, the other thing is channel shifting. Uh, so I think Elena already mentioned uh, ecom. So uh, you know certainly uh, I, that's that's worth noting, right? The revolution is now, right? Uh, ecom is, uh, uh, is is you know taking you know three, five, seven years uh, worth of steps into the future, and uh, I don't think that's going to come backwards. Uh, the channels that slowed uh, from from our perspective, you see uh, convenience slowed a little bit, at least initially. I, I think, especially as, as you see the mobility trends decline. I know uh, I'm not stopping for gas twice a week as I used to, so that that probably means I'm making fewer trips into the convenience store. Uh, the drug channel, likewise, I think has has been a little soft uh, in the past uh, six to twelve months. So I think. Again, understanding where those channel dynamics have been and then now plotting to where do we expect them to go uh, as, as things start to reopen and, and as you, you see that, that lift or that return to, um, uh, return to a normal. Yeah. 
So, so staying on that theme, let's start thinking about you know the, the number of vaccines. And I'm I'm in New Jersey, and I'm trying to get a vaccine, and everywhere is fully booked. <laughs> so I'm on the list for about May to June, I think. Um, but as can as we start to kind of open up again, and people are getting vaccinated, and hopefully maybe Easter is the last holiday where we are kind of on full lockdown. What changes are you anticipating for your category? And Elena, kind of particularly for you, what kind of changes are you are you expecting to see, or are you you planning to, to even keep a track of those changes? Oh, absolutely. We are on it. We definitely track the changes. We have a lot of tools in our toolbox to do that with. But what has been interesting is that we all have to agree that home is uh, definitely the new hub, right? It's our office, that's our school, that's our gym, it's our you know restaurant and the entertainment center and so forth. And all this evolves and all this has a role to play. And of course, you know, with our products, we have seen people cleaning much more, diving into every nook and cranny, using every product under the sun to now study that product and use it. We see a lot of the peripheral products, you know, additive types of products, you know, really being used much higher higher. We have definitely seen uh, seasonal products explode and shift forward so much more, for example, in air care, where we saw people decorating for the holidays, uh, probably as soon as Halloween was done. Um, we can talk about people cooking and therefore cleaning much more. You know, your kids have now all learned how to wash the dishes and cook their own meals. And that has been a positive side effect of this. So this has been definitely um, a very interesting thing. But at the same time, what happens on the outside? So what happens when we're brave enough to actually leave the comfort of our home? And how do we still feel that sense of control that we all talked about and enable and really inspire our consumers and shoppers to have that in their own space? So what does that mean? Well, a lot of on-the-go products that will now be much more front and center. When we ask shoppers, what is actually in your purse or in your bag? Well, it's no longer just your lipstick or your Band-Aid or a pen. It's uh, much more, I need my wipes, I need my disinfecting spray. And quite frankly, it could also be my clothing disinfection. Because before we thought that your clothing was a barrier against the outside elements. Now it's a carrier of germs into your household. So how do you make sure you don't bring that into your home? So a lot of the on the go could actually explode quite a bit as a result, as we enable and inspire our shoppers to protect themselves. But the third interesting element is what do the businesses, retailers, offices, airlines, hotels do to give that reassurance that is associated with their brand that once you enter their space, you're actually going to be just as safe or at least safer which is why you see the explosion of the deals where Lysol and Clorox sign up with uh, you know, big airlines, Delta or United, or hotels, uh, Hilton, for example, that uh, Lysol has the relationship with, or Ubers or Airbnbs. So this will continue to proliferate. And the retailers who can give you that reassurance as you enter their store with wipes and sanitizer and further messages, especially in the drug channel, for example, or elsewhere, you know, regardless of the business, will become critical in building that trust, giving shoppers the reassurance they need into the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's a very detailed answer. And, uh, and Linda, um, for your category, as the world starts to open up again, what are your thoughts? So I personally think that um, snacking is going to continue to grow. Um, where we will see those changes is kind of across the shopper preferences. So pack sizes and then the health benefits, flavor attributes. Um, we're also going to have to kind of relearn the seasonal behavior because in the last year, gatherings were smaller. They were virtual. They were just really different than what we've had in the past. Um, but I think with the first waves of vaccines complete, restrictions being lifted, um, I think Matt on his uh, more recent, your CEO on his recent um, post, he posted about uh, flights increasing in search. I think uh, yeah. spring weather upon us, it's definitely going to bring a time for change. Um, people are going to be gathering again, but we'll see snacks play an important role. Um, but to what extent? So it's kind of like, will shoppers feel okay grabbing chips out of a communal bowl? Or will multi-packs be present to kind of curb the gym, germs? Um, will there be, uh, you know, people be bringing their own cups? So it's kind of understanding that. And then um, we'll likely see a return to school and routine um, where our brands are going to be playing a key role. 
Um, so we'll need to refine messaging and really align to the shopper needs during these times. Um, it's going to be very different. Uh, the mindset is going to be kind of all over the board. Um, so with this return to school and normal, we'll likely see a shift from in-home consumption to out-of-home, mostly for children. But um, we are probably going to expect, like we talked about earlier, um, a lot of adults are still going to be home. So um, that lunchtime occasion will still be very important to kind of capture. Yeah, it was really interesting to see. You, you mentioned that Matt had talked about the, um, the number of searches for flights had outpaced the number of searches for Netflix. And I have actually booked my first vacation. So fingers crossed for <laughs> August. <laughs> so I can actually leave the state of New Jersey. Um, and, uh, and over to you, Phil. Uh, when thinking about the world opening up again, what are your thoughts for your brands? Sure. So, you know, I think we, we, we talked about this a bit before, but I, I suspect that the in-home behavior that we've seen and we've developed over the course of the past 12 and will probably be 18 plus months by, by the time you get to that point, will we'll stick to a degree. I think that the, um, you know, what is it? It only takes three to four weeks for a new behavior to become a routine. So I think a lot of the, the routines that we've gotten used to are probably going to stick with us at least for, for an interim time period. I also think I don't know that uh, all um, all employers are going to ring the bell and say five days a week, get, get back into the office. My suspicion is that a version of flexible working relationships is probably going to become one of the things that comes out of this pandemic. So I think what that means is a lot of that in-home consumption is going to stay, is going to be a, a retained behavior. Uh, and yet, I'm also banking on the fact that mobility, a return to travel, a return to commuting is going to uh, lead to a rise in impulse yet again, that people are going to be looking for those quick pick-me-ups. They're going to be looking for, again, uh, whether it's a snack, whether it's a treat, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a beverage or a cup of coffee. I think those impulse occasions are going to return. Uh, and then the, the final one that I know I'm really looking forward to is all of the special occasion makeup calls that uh, we, we've missed a lot in the past year, right? I think we're all very fortunate to be in the in the circumstances that we are in, and yet, you, you know, we, we, we haven't been able to properly celebrate the way that I think Americans like to look forward to celebrating things. And I think as those special occasions come up, and also as the everyday occasions seem a lot more special than maybe they used to, I think that's something that we're going to want to better understand is how, as you go forward towards those makeup calls, what are the products that are going to be a part of those occasions? Uh, you know, as Lindsay mentioned, the, what are the, you know, are, are there potentially special packaging or special containers that, that you need to be thinking about? How is that event going to go down? Uh, and, and again, I think that that's going to lead to a, a, a surge in, in, uh, in, new, uh, in new behavior as well. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned we missed so much. St. Patrick's Day this week kind of flew by without really a a, a green beer or, or anything else in between. Um, so changing tracks kind of slightly and thinking about the the market research tools that you're using. How are you anticipating consumer trends um, as things change so rapidly? What kind of uh, market research tools are you using, um, and and how are you even keeping up to speed with with what's happening with consumers? And Lindsay, we'll, uh, we'll go back to you if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, I think just focusing on, on vendors that are very agile um, and quick, like Susie, I mean, we have really enjoyed working with you guys, um, you know, over the past year because we have been able to get quick results. Um, you know, and things are going to shift and we have to be very agile and be able to respond quickly to these changes. Um, so again, going back to your Matt, when he posted that outpacing of um, flights versus Netflix, I think that's pretty telling that um, people are getting more comfortable with travel again, uh, which tells me that we could see some positivity around certain channels that neg negatively or saw neg uh, declines during the pandemic, like C-Store. Um, I think a lot of shoppers are going to be sticking to their newly developed shopping routines, um, but it'll be interesting to see like the channels that won during the pandemic, if they will continue to see success or if others will be able to capture those shoppers that have since gone to them. Um, so that's kind of what, what I would say. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Elena, what about yourself? How are you keeping up to date with all the, the fast moving consumer trends? I would second what 
said and built on this. I think what is really important is not just the methodology, but also ensuring that it's longitudinal. It has to be very, very fast. I think that we don't have enough luxury of time because things change so much, but it has to be longitudinal and it has to be continuous. Uh, in my view, if you just get a data point and it's a good, to, you know, good information to have, it still becomes just a data point. If, however, you track things longitudinally, it gives you the frame of reference and it becomes actionable. So to me, having that as a perspective is very, very critical, especially as situation evolves. So we can really understand the psychology behind the behavior. Yeah. And those tracker data points must be kind of all over the place over the last year. Phil, as you mentioned, you know, this time last year with that great stock up process, if you're looking at year on year comparisons, it must be, you know, really kind of crazy to, to, to look for those patterns. Um, and with that said, Phil, what kind of tools are you using and uh, and how are you keeping up to the to speed with the pace of change for consumers? Sure. So I'm I'm a big fan of building a toolkit of resources, right? So I think that we we want to make sure we have wrenches for problems that need wrenches and screwdrivers for problems that need screwdrivers. I think this has been a great year for gathering insights. I think that uh, you know the the insights community really rallied in the space and uh, I think that a lot of the providers that we work with have been publishing, uh, as, as you mentioned, ongoing uh, information because our understanding of where trends were going has changed on a monthly, weekly, and in fact, uh, frequently daily basis. And I think, uh, again, as we, we were talking a little bit about the, the lift time period and, you know, the truth, and this is a difficult statement to make as an insight person, but the truth is, I don't know how a lot of things are going to turn out, right? And I think the only way that I'm going to feel confident in the insights going forward is to test and retest, right? And to be able to test those statements and, and double check uh, and, and, and get real-time reaction. I think that's going to be very important to us in, in, in uh, being nimble uh, business leaders is understanding how is our consumer, how is our shopper reacting in this exact moment? Because how they might, they, they very well could have answered questions truthfully 30, 60, 90 days ago and feel very differently today. I need to know what they feel today as the, the leading projector of how they're going to feel in the, in the near future. Yeah. Awesome. So this time last year, I actually I joined Susie over the summer. So this time last year, I was at a panel company, so I could see how many completed surveys were being completed um, on a daily basis. And there certainly was a a big gap. Whereas a lot of a lot of clients said, "Just going to put this on hold until next month. We'll put this on hold for a couple of weeks." Did your brands put consumer research on hold? Is there a gap in your data set from kind of this time last year, or did you lean in even faster? Um, Yelena, we'll start with you because I'm pretty sure for your categories there was probably no It's, it's a fantastic question. So um, the uh, kind of anecdotal story is uh, as soon as COVID hit, I actually called one of my um, uh, vendors um, and all of our vendors are a natural extension of our team. They're truly great partners with us. And I said, the first thing that I did is I said at the beginning of the conversation, let me just tell you, I am not calling you to cancel any of my projects. <laughs> and I'm laughing to this day because a lot of people were, a lot of companies were, and I actually thought that that was the time of the disruption is the time to lean in and invest. So we actually very quickly had to pivot and rethink our entire research plan for the year. And certain things we retained and some of them we just shifted the questions. But we actually ended up leaning right away and asking more and creating more projects to understand how shoppers were pivoting in our categories. So as a result, we ended up creating a couple of different waves of shopper behavior in the moment that we're still running to keep track of just that. And it has actually gave us a, a huge competitive advantage in the retailer conversations when everybody was panicking we could actually bring to everybody a little bit more of the sense of control over the situation mm -hmm. that's great phil was that the same for your brands was there a, a big pause did you pause mark pause any of the projects thinking it would only be a couple of weeks and any gaps in your data set? No, I, I think there was an instinct very very early to hold uh, to, to at least understand the, 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 where the environment was going to shift. But again, the reality is that we're, we're going to need to try and build a, a shopper and a consumer understanding whether there's a pandemic or not. And I, I think now part of the challenge is that this will, that, that 
the America of 2022 is going to be very different than the America of 2019. It's, it's probably going to be on par with, you think, pre-war, post-war in the, in the 1940s. So I think a lot of insights work that we had done that was very well done 2019 and beforehand is probably going to need to be refreshed. So I would say that the, in the very short term, the, the goal was to, to, to pivot towards research, uh, resources and, and research that is going to benefit this moment. But then the, the next step, the learning plan has to be, what, it, what are all the things that uh, you ordinarily might have aged more gracefully, the, the, the consumer decision trees of the world, that, uh, you know, the, the work that you could potentially live with for three, five years, depending on the design of your category, that now, again, those, that, that's as if that's, post, that's pre-war analytics. We need, we need, we need post-pandemic analytics. So I think, uh, again, planning that learning plan will be, will be very important. Yeah, for sure. And Lindsay, did you guys put anything on pause, thinking it may only be a couple of weeks? Um, is there any gaps in you have your data set, or did you all run pretty quickly into consumer? We, um, we were very lucky that we did not have a pause on um, insight, so our budget didn't get taken. So we actually just pivoted from what we were planning to do. Um, and I think that the work that we were able to accomplish has been pretty significant. We were able to try out new vendors. We were try, um, able to just really do a lot of the things that we had wanted to do um, all within the last year. So I think we were pretty lucky in that sense. Um, and we were able to do, uh, like I said, talk to all of our panel, um, really understand their behaviors. And I don't think that 2021 um, is a year that we want to kind of, or 2020 is a year that we want to forget. I think it's just going to help pivot the way that we are thinking and that shoppers will be behaving um, in the upcoming years. So I think it's super important that we were able to capture that. Yeah, that's great. So big lofty question, difficult question for you all. Um, where do you see category management and shopper insights headed over the next kind of three to five years? Um, it's gonna be a lot of work to do. I think it's gonna be the answer from all three of you. Um, but Yelena, where do, what kind of trends do you see within category management over the next three to five years? Or what do you hope to see in the next three to five years? Well, I think that this current situation has actually uh, highlighted and brought to the surface uh, the realization by many companies that there is a huge need for shopper insights. It is the opening act to any uh, substantial retailer meeting. It is the opening act to discussing innovation, the category growth, uh, understanding the growth pillars overall. Without it, it just becomes the pie in the sky. And so for us to be much more targeted, to be much more focused, this has to be rooted in everything that we do. And not just with one big project that happens and anchors ourselves in time, it has to be the ongoing um, uh, tracking of behaviors that are now shifting so quickly and uh, really can be embedded both in the big picture themes as well as the daily um, validation of certain um, behaviors or segments that we might not even ourselves directly play in but have the indirect impact on our success. Yeah and Phil what about um, for you what, 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 what do you hope to see for the next three to five years in capital management? So first off, I, I agree. I think fact-based selling is, you know, has been an ongoing trend. I think, you know, leading with insights is going to continue to be very important. You know, I think beyond that, I think it, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see that resources and capabilities, I think, are becoming much more democratized across the, the different industries. That I think there was a time period where I think there, there was a select few uh, organizations that potentially had access uh, or budgets or capabilities, but as technology has 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 moved uh, moved along and really changed the game from how we can get the answers that we need to get and how quickly we can get the answers we can get, I think that allows more players to be a part of the conversation, and that should net net be a good thing for uh, for the industry. I think certainly from the, the categories that I participate in, I think the opportunity to make sure that there are more voices in the conversation uh, can can only lead to more positive outcomes. And with that, I think that that will lead for uh, challenges in where are the balance points within category management? How do we make sure that we are we are representing velocity and incrementality in the conversation? How are we uh, best representing the need for base business and the need to innovate in the space? And again, how do those uh, additional voices in the the room 
uh, add a add a real value now that you know again the the the, the access to the information is not the is, is not the gatekeeper. Yeah, so you raise a really good point about the democratization of of insights. Do you have any examples of how you're doing it well at your company and how you're democratizing those insights? Sure. So I think uh, one of the big things that we've worked in is is better understanding the the assortment capabilities within our categories. Uh, and again, building out, modeling out the the, the message as I mentioned. Uh, how do we make sure that the we ultimately we want to make sure that the the shelf space and the promoted space that all of the available space is working as hard as it can for the retailer and for the category. Uh, I think that. There, there are again more and more tools that are available that can that we can use to accomplish that. And uh, again, uh, making sure that we have uh, the the right information at our disposal, that we are sharing that information with our salespeople, and then most importantly with the retailers and building that that retailer manufacturer collaborative opportunity. I think that's uh, that's an example of how how do we how do we take the the, the couple of data nuggets that again, used to be held by the few and make sure they are now held by the many. Yeah, excellent. And how's that working um, over at Campbell Snacks, Lindsay? How are you democratizing insights across your company? Yeah, I mean, thankfully over the last year, um, we've been able to kind of just work very cross-functionally um, very well. So I think, uh, you know, for us, the partnership has just been super strong across shopper insights and category. Um, we are so strong together, um, leaning into the insight, providing the actionable outcomes and recommendations to our retailers, I think has been super key. Um, and without the insights, I think that uh, it's, it's hard to, to provide a recommendation without them saying, okay, great, why? So why Campbell's next? Why, why this, why that? Um, so I would definitely say that the cross functionality across the two has been super strong in um, insights and recommendations to our customers and internally as well. Yeah, it's great. We've, it's almost like we've never, in my career in market research, it's never been such a key time for us really to have the spotlight on us. Um, and even from a recruitment perspective, we at Susie are growing super fast and we're trying to recruit and insights folks are in such great demand right now that, uh, that two, twofold effect, um, we're finding it hard to, to find great people but number two we're finding them all over the USA so we now have employees in Nashville in Arizona in Texas and so when we do open an office again there will be almost half of us that will be working from home from completely different states um, as well um, when it comes to um, probably question and just for, for you Yelena with your category what does that return to the office kind of look like and then what kind of insights are you and, and trends do you foresee when it comes to office cleaning protocols are you hearing anything right now um, great question. So from the insight standpoint, I can tell you that, uh, you know, using Susie's insights, uh, over 50% of people do not plan to return to the office full time and a quarter of them do not plan to return to the office at all. So again, in the spirit of home as a hub, how do we rethink about what that new normal looks like? And how do we continue to support our shoppers and protect them and sustain it? I do believe that that uh, opportunity of flexibility will actually serve us and our brands extremely well. First of all, because you can attract greater talent at a wider territory. Uh, second of all, we have now learned, and the IT companies have been doing this for you know years, that we're trying to enable the tools to um, allow us to do what we're doing right now. It just happened so much faster. And now we have adapted, we have developed behaviors, we have developed the tools that enable us to work just as you know, flexibly you know, and happily. You know? And uh, you know, I guess some of the work condenses because you close your laptop and you, know, you came home from work, but um, in that, that hour can be spent you know, doing more projects, I guess. But <laughs> I think that overall, it does give people more flexibility overall. I do believe that there is still the need for physical collaboration because for many of us, you know, type A personalities, it's what gives us energy, right? But at the same time, I think uh, there is going to be that, you know, energy flexibility uh, balance that we will continue to uh, evolve. Yeah, it's interesting. We have a, an internal anonymous survey with our employees and the question of going back to office comes up on that. And 
you have some people who are saying, um, I can't wait to burn my desk and sleep in the office because I can't wait to be around people again. <laughs> um, and other people who are saying, you know, I, I'm so productive at home, I don't ever want to go back to an office. So it's really kind of, you know, myself included, I had never worked from home before and I actually am surprised at how productive um, we can be. For, for your category also, um, Yelena, obviously the flu numbers, the regular flu numbers are significantly down this year. And if we're not going back, if 25% of people aren't going back to an office and 50% aren't going back full time, um, what, what does that mean for some of the, the kind of flu preventative and, and treatment mm -hmm. categories? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I think it's a good thing that people are not coming down with more diseases and sickness. That's what, after all, we're all about. Um, I think that having that category, uh, upper respiratory category in the store is still extremely reassuring and must have. You know, we're still going out. After all, we're not living in a bunker. But at the same time, I think it just brings up more value in um, focusing on our health in slightly different ways. Focusing on our health is a prevention, which means that our vitamin category is going to continue to grow and people will continue to get educated on the need for the vitamins and supplements and the right ingredients and the right quality and the assortment and variety for different evolution stages of your life, which I think will be a positive. So there will be many other categories to sort of play a role and evolve but when shoppers do need it, we're absolutely there for them with the best products possible. And don't forget that Mucinex, which is our brand, is also addressing chronic conditions. So there are going to be those incidents where this product is a must regardless of the germs that surround us. Yeah, excellent. So we have two questions from the audience, um, and I'm going to start with uh, from um, Ronaldo. Uh, is shopper marketing drawing more attention to support strategies at companies? Um, and Phil, we'll start with you. How is shop marketing having an impact? Sure. You know, so I think the, the easy answer is yes. Uh, you know, I think uh, shopper marketing uh, is, is certainly of increased importance to us now. I think, uh, you know, especially we talked a little bit before about uh, e-commerce and omni-channel. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the tactics that are really um, ingrained in the way that we go to market uh, in a brick and mortar environment are different, of course, in, a, in an e-com and an omni-channel space. So I think making sure that we have sh inter integrated shopper marketing plans, whether it's for a new product launch, whether it's coming into a, a key season, I think is has always been important, but will become that much more important. Yeah. And then Z, how how's that? playing out at, at Campbell's next. I definitely agree. Um, it's definitely a big role for us as well um, and a focus, especially online and offline because they are so different. Um, kind of leaning into the seasonal behaviors and the insights um, and taking action into the shopper marketing during the timeframes and also the key customers at channels um, that are relatively important. Um, so I would say it's definitely a big focus for us as well in this whole spectrum of category shopper, consumer insights. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And for Yelena at RB, is shopper marketing becoming a, has more attention? Absolutely. I think that it is getting much more concise. It's getting much more evolved. Uh, we continue to evolve the craft. Uh, to second what Phil was saying, shopper insights is such a key role, uh, you know, for the agencies to understand what makes our shoppers and retailers tick, what channels enjoy which types of tactics better uh, is paramount. And the more quality insights we have, the better the output will be in every function. So this is absolutely a critical thing. And I would agree with you that the more unique occasions and unique solutions we can provide that indicate that we as you know, key brands understand what is value added to our shoppers is critical. Seasonal is by far uh, you know, the most interesting topic that we can discuss. And I do question really, and really are wondering how the new back to school and the holiday season preparation would look like? How does the new Halloween continue to look like? And what will happen with all those fantastic candy giving occasions that we're so loving in this culture? So I think that, uh, you know, to go back to your question, it is absolutely uh, con will continue to um, elevate itself uh, in parallel to what we're doing with Shopper Insights Generation. Excellent. All right, another question um, from the audience. Keep them coming. Thank you so much. Just put them in the question uh, bucket. So for those of you that have access to an internal panel, what do you see as the unique benefit of talking to your consumers versus maybe surveying your competitors' consumers? 
So is it within the shopper world, is there a need to always focus just on your core consumers or to broadly understand the category purchasers as a whole? So everybody got the question <laughs> there? I was just reading it straight off. Phil, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Sure. I mean, I think uh, obviously uh, budget constraints always come into play here, but I think in a in a world where you can be a band, I would rather be a band, right? I I certainly want to be able to best understand our core shopper as we as we understand them, and and I think make sure that we're we're able to properly define who that core shopper is and talk to them and and understand how do we uh, how do we really continue to delight them uh, on a on an ongoing basis. But I also think that you need to be able to cast a wider net. To understand, you know, most most of Americans are not our shopper today, right? You know, so how do we uh, how do we fix that, right? And and I think we we can't learn how to catch the the, the new the new cast uh, if if we're only constantly focusing on the, the existing shopper. So again, it's it's probably a balance of both. Yeah, yeah. And Elena, what about for you? Um, I would look at it slightly differently, but kind of building on what Phil was saying, uh, the consumer portion and looking at the brand specifically is critical to us when we focus internally and as we develop our brands and enhance the quality of our brands and appeal to the shoppers. However, at the end of the day, within the category management function, my my end goal and my uh, key, I guess, consumer for service providing is my retailer, my buyers. My buyers do not care to only hear about my brands. They really need to grow their entire category and the entire aisle. So if I come to them with a message for my brand, it becomes very self-serving. I don't want to do that. I want to provide the objective view because as we grow their category, everybody wins. And ultimately, you know, it is about our uh, retailers and about our consumers. So to me, that becomes much more paramount and much more objective overall. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and Lindsay, what about your, yourself? I would agree with both, um, that mm. we are kind of uh, just focusing a lot on total category snacking. Um, so instead of just keeping ourselves siloed, it helps you understand what opportunities are out there, um, how the category is progressing within each of respective category. Um, but also, you know, we'd be remiss if we weren't talking to our shoppers directly. Um, so we do definitely take track of that um, and make sure that we are uh, keeping a panel internally of our, our shoppers, but also externally of our non-shoppers and total category shoppers. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, another question from the audience, so from, came from Luke. Have you been putting more emphasis on behavioral methodologies during COVID? And Lindsay, we'll go back to you. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, we conducted some passive purchase work uh, while we were in the pandemic, um, in times where there was a lot of supply on the shelves, um, we made sure of that. Um, but we were able to understand kind of that behavior of the shopper as they are shopping specific categories um, and uh, in certain retailers, come back to them with um, recommendations and insights. So we absolutely put a very huge emphasis on the behavioral um, challenges of, of shoppers. Excellent. I'm sure there was a lot of behavioral work that you guys did. I can jump in. Um, I totally agree. I think that because uh, COVID became such a disruptor and it escalated everything and the research had to happen so quickly in terms of consumer and shopper understanding, uh, we pretty much found that a lot of our questions between consumer questions and shopper questions ended up being blended. And we really needed to understand how people were behaving at home. And then that was in a way manifesting itself in the store and vice versa, because some products were quite frankly not available. So it became really a blended, much more of a kind of grayer area scenario, as opposed to more distinct functions that typically were separated between the shopper insights generation and the consumer research generation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. There's a really great question from Wade. If I understand it correctly, Wade, I think the question you're asking is, um, you would like to understand how e-commerce projects and omnichannel strategy, should it be included in the category management team? Um, is it an appropriate function or should it just be supported by the category management team? I think is, Wade, I hope I got your question <laughs> correct there. Phil, um, what, would your, what would your response be there? Sure. So I. If I'm understanding the correct question correctly, I, I, I absolutely think that category management has a role to play in, in omni-channel. 
uh, part of that is, is again, the omni portion of, of, of e-commerce, right? That a lot of our best uh, e-commerce customers are also our best brick and mortar customers. And I, I think less and less the, the, the buyer is going to want to have a conversation that will be exclusively brick and mortar. They're probably going to want to have an omni-channel conversation. So I think, uh, you know, beginning, beginning at the, you know, the starting point, what is the core idea? What is the core narrative? Uh, what is, what is the core insight? And then the application of that is probably going to be different in e-com no different or it will be different in different ways but similar to the way that we have to think of convenience differently than drug differently than food different you know so on and so forth uh, i think it's 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 obviously a, a a channel that we need to understand what are the rules of the road um uh, how how do you how do you best adapt that core insight to fit this channel but uh, again I, I i certainly would not uh i would never want to turn a blind eye to uh, to, to e-com from a category standpoint. Yeah, is that the same for you, Yelena? I think that this is where the word agility comes to mind because omnichannel is so new, it was new, and it is evolving so fast that it keeps staying new. And sometimes it's very difficult to determine who really will do what. And sometimes it's the matter of the business question and the opportunity that comes our way. So I would say that it comes from both areas from both the uh, e-com team as well as category management and shopper insights, where we sort of see the opportunity and we then figure out, you know, who really needs to address it best to give it more depth, more mileage overall, more the relationship engagement. And so uh, it becomes really uh, an agility teamwork game to ensure the success. And there are a couple of different areas here, right? There is the insights generation, there is the solution generation to this, and there is the, you know, kind of like fixing and engaging the customers. So sometimes it is passing the baton between each and being really nimble because it also varies extremely by where the customers are or retailers are. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Lindsay, you talked about um, a little bit earlier about that teamwork and you know the beginning of the pandemic, your team were potentially looking at insights and silos, bringing that back together. Would you say that um, you know, e-commerce and omnichannel sits within category management or, or is just a functional support system? I, I would say a functional support system, um, just given that they are very different shoppers. Um, well, a lot of, from our research, we did see a lot of people are going to be very omni. So they're going to be shopping both in-store and online. But I think having um, the recommendations of both in-store and online um, is super key. Uh, so I would just, I would definitely say a support rather than um, a function. Awesome, thank you. All right, so to wrap up, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you, everybody in the audience. Obviously, there's a lot of Casco managers who are, who are on the call who are asking some of those questions um, there. What final advice would you have for category managers as we navigate through the rest of just this year? Let's focus on just this year for now. Um, Yelena, what advice could you share with the, with the people in the audience? Um, I would say that put your customer first. You know, see what really is going to make them successful. What will make them happy, what will make them energized at the end of the day to be able to talk to you so that you can continue to bring to them the incremental value, not because you have the insight and you're going to throw it their way, but what insight will be truly meaningful to your buyers that will actually drive an action behind it, something that will be more of an aha as opposed to something that everybody knows. I think that fewer better nuggets is better just, uh, you know, than just a showering, you know, them, them with endless um, uh, information or quite frankly getting bogged down by detail so that would be probably one of the most critical things and also don't be afraid to think outside of the box consider new methodologies consider new vendors consider new ideas and really listen to what those buyers are saying and try to step back and to really think about a solution as opposed to just the canned uh, product in your existing toolbox this is the time to do it <laughs> awesome Phil, what advice do you have for category managers for the rest of this year? Sure. So first off, I'd say this is a good time to be in in category management. This is a good good time mm -hmm. to be in the in the insights uh, space, right? Uh, feels like the tent is getting bigger. Uh, we, we we have better toys to work with, so that's uh, it's it's a fun time to be in category management. Uh, you know, I would say if I could if I could point towards the focus, it would be 
focus on insights to action. I think if um, uh, if we had a non-insights person on the phone, uh, one of the more common complaints that you might receive of them is that we, we report the news, right? And, and I, I don't want our team to be seen as people who report the news. I want our team to be the team that says, here is what to do with this news, right? We've uncovered, you know, as, as Elena mentioned, the one true nugget, the one or two true nuggets, this is the data point you really need to see, and this is what I need you to do about it, right? This is what we're going to go do about it together. I think that's, if, if, you, can, if you can lean into that behavior, I think that's, that, that's going to lead to better outcomes for everyone involved. Yeah, awesome. And Lindsay, bring us home. What's your final piece of advice for everybody in the audience? I mean, I think, Phil, you, like basically I echo everything that you just said. Um, you know, I personally am on Shopper Insights, but I partner with my category management team. And I think that it's a great opportunity for them right now. Our customers are looking for the insights from us and the recommendations. And I think, um, you know, just kind of taking that insight to action and um, being proactive on the recommendations and not being afraid to, to say something that they may not want to hear. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity right now. So take advantage of uh, where we are. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, panel. It's been absolutely wonderful. I've learned a lot over the past hour. I really hope the audience has as well. I want to thank CMA and SEMA for your partnership with us today. I have been Katie Gross from Susie, and I really hope everybody stays safe, well, and healthy over the rest of the year. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.